straight about it. This is why the debate over Tariq Ramadan coming <clears throat> to the United States set off a, a very interesting little Roman candle from my point of view because it revealed the difference between those who want to think about Plan B and those who don't. And it's in part secularists in the Middle East whom one has to be willing then to say this to because exactly. there's no one more hostile a, to organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood than people who have fought and shed blood mm-hmm. for, and have for pure in, secularism. And have suffered incredibly. Though, though there you see a little bit of softening. So the, the leading Egyptian civil society um, secularist is a man called Saad Adin Ibrahim who has definitely paid the price in terms of spending time in prison and so forth. Um, and he used to have that view, but he's actually moved substantially. I think probably was being in prison with Muslim brothers. So he says, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, and I, it seems that you know he has a slightly more of a pragmatic view. He's thinking more in Plan B terms now. But he's a category of one in, in Egyptian, very yeah, close pretty, to an Egyptian. He's, he's a, he's very few other people. He's, he's, a wonderful, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. yeah he's he's yeah, very much trapped myself. Well, I think it's worth just noticing uh, that if you draw a graph and plot it, uh, plot along it of secularism in the Muslim world. Uh, it's a consistent finding that the more separation of religion and politics there is, the happier, more open, more prosperous the country is. That would be true of Turkey, of Tunisia, of Indonesia, where explicitly it is not allowed for the mullahs to run politics. The Constitution forbids it. Uh, And where the no literal interpretation of the Quran is allowed in respect of, for example, women's rights or the rights of non-Muslim minorities. It's just easy. The more secularism, the better. We just have to understand that that is and always has to be plan A. And how could it be different? And look at, um, if you want to see how the proposition can be tested, draw a graph above the societies that are the most devout, Mm. the most under the rule of the the, um, ulema. But you're partly talking about the difference between Arab and non-Arab Islamic countries, right? Terrifying, terrifying backwards. (laughs) And also, and this is very important, aggressive Mm. states. They they project their state failure into rogue state conduct. Mm. Because they can't blame their... They cannot blame their failure on themselves. It can't be because they've tried to follow the Quran that their children's teeth are falling out. It must be a Jewish crusader conspiracy. So the violence must be pushed out to our society, which is why, by the way, our plan B has to be, and we have to be ready for it, a clash of civilizations. That's plan B. It's coming, and we'd better be ready for it. And we'd better say that our civilization is worth fighting for. We we haven't discussed what it is about Islam that makes this unpleasant fact so salient. Okay. It, it isn't just that it's a plagiarism of Judaism and Christianity. It's it, plagiarism of the worst bits of these two. They just steal, they pick and choose the garbage stuff about hellfire and stoning and, and amputation punishments. Um, they, from Christianity, they say virgin birth, yes. Um, Jesus, probably not son of God, because actually then there's some paranoid nonsense about he, someone else was crucified in his place and the, the Jews pulled some trick and so on. Anti-Semitism, uh, riddled throughout the whole all of this garbage and drivel lifted at random from earlier texts. Very sinister and always the worst and most intolerant kind. And no experience with Greek or Latin civilization mm. involved in this at all. None. Desert stuff. Mm. So really pretty lousy. <clears throat> and then making the unbelievably arrogant claim of finalism. It is the last and final and unimprovable word of God. Anything said after it is profane, redundant, pitiful and unnecessary. And those of us who can be called, which we're not, Christians or Jews, that's the only exemptions they allow, allowed to be people of the book, fortunate because we are part of the great plagiarism. Mm. This is a form of condescension known in fact and in practice as dimitude, as you, you'll be tolerated when we take over the world, <laughs> which we will do. Okay, let me stop you because I, we're, you getting, see, we're getting refuse, close to I, our last I few minutes here. Be, I decline to be talked to in this tone of mm. voice, even by a moderate Muslim. Mm. And you should decline to be talked to in that tone of voice also, ladies and gentlemen. All right. so, so, you're allowed my, to reply. so my so which parts do you take exception, if any? Uh, essentially, every single every single sentence there. But let me start with, this, with this, <laughs> but let me start with the, the most let me start with the most salient one, which is this call for the clash of civilizations. And also, let me refer to the, just the fact that 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 particular of all of Christopher's clever comments, that's the one that got the applause. Why? Because I think there's this again this visceral instinct to uh, that the Muslim world is is to be feared and, and hated. Now, some of it's uh, a result, unquestionably, of the attacks of September 11th, which actually happened right here, um, and were, were carried out by people who did, did so in the name of Islam. So I don't mean to, to ignore that, that fact. But so on the clash of civilizations, that can't be plan B because it's not connected to an actually existing political reality. There aren't, in fact, countries in the Muslim world with the capacity um, 
or at the country level, the interest in engaging in this sort of a global clash of civilizations. Osama bin Laden doesn't, in fact, have a country behind him. Um, he has a, you know, a, a movement of individuals who <coughs> form themselves into groups to perform terrorist attacks. Um, and indeed, most importantly of all, you can't have a clash of civilizations when the civilizations are interpenetrated. And what Christopher calls plagiarism, I call inter- integrated influence, I mean mutual influence. So, you know, that, that's on the, on the big clash of civilizations point. And then on the, on the sort of particular, particular details, you know, actually there's some terrible things about Judaism and Christianity that are absent in Islam. Uh, you know, they didn't pick up every bad thing. Uh, and there are some very good things about Christianity and Judaism that can be yeah, found in Islam. See, and then Islam has some other some things. Problems, and then Islam has some other things that are very good that are not products of well, Judaism and Christianity. Let me ask you, I mean, Mark, it's, 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 you know, are there, would you say there are enough, in effect, docking points between Islam and the West that the idea of a clash of civilizations actually is a kind of unnecessarily apocalyptic thing to, to fear? Yeah. I mean, civilizations aren't things that clash. Uh, that's not, I mean, the metaphors are just all wrong. They aren't self-conscious entities. You do have flashpoints, obviously. But, you know, we should also be aware that, you know, even in religious political relations within the West, there's tremendous variety. Let's remember that. That ministers in Germany are paid by the state. They are not paid by the state in Spain. You can wear a headscarf to school in the Netherlands. You cannot in France. <clears throat> Religious schools are paid for with state funds in Great Britain and in Canada. That's unconstitutional in the United States. We in the West do not have one line on this. We have ways of coping with this problem. And in Europe in particular, we have a new population that is difficult, if not impossible, to fully incorporate in the foreseeable future into our understanding of liberal democracy at a theoretical level. So we have to think of practical things that allow us to get along that will slowly change things. But uh, to think of even ourselves as monolithic on this question is a mistake. Okay, I want well, to... We, we, yeah. we certainly are not, but we should be more so. I'll give you a, a tiny example. Just very brief, because okay. then we have to go to questions. Well, the, the, an afternoon newspaper in Denmark, as is well known, published some satirical cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the embassies of Denmark were burned in Muslim, the capital of Muslim countries where demonstrations are not normally allowed. Uh, Danish and its other Scandinavian individuals were murdered. A Danish <coughs> economy was put under a very devastating uh, worldwide Muslim boycott. And the ambassadors of 24 countries went to call upon the Prime Minister in Copenhagen as a diplomat de marche, not representing Morocco, Algeria, um, etc., but representing a religion, 24 of them, to demand that he break his own law and impose censorship on the Danish press, which he's not allowed to do by the Danish constitution, in their favor. Yeah. And no, no, no other country stood by Denmark. Mm. Our own didn't. The State Department condemned the cartoons. So that, don't worry, we're not unanimous. But don't worry, increasingly they are. And the, there's only one real division in my mind. It's between the people who realize this and are getting ready for it, for this confrontation, and those who are pretending it's not happening. Well, then we're going to stop and the, at that. And the premillennial that. dispensationalists are somebody else, Christopher? Hmm? I mean, who, you know, these premillennial dispensationalists whom you were you know, making fun of earlier, I mean... Their view sounds extremely similar to yours. There are two kinds of people, those who are getting ready for the end of days and those who aren't. Have it your way. I don't think I don't think think that's very clever. (laughs) Okay, I'm gonna stop here at this at this moment. So we're gonna have about fifteen minutes for questions. First, I'm gonna read a few questions that have come in from the web, and then we'll have at least ten minutes or so for those of you in the audience who have questions. There are microphones on either side, so those of you who do have questions, please line up. And I'm sorry, I'm sure we won't be able to take all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best. So our first question, which comes from Thaisa in Rio de Janeiro, says, uh, what is your take on the creationism movement to teach both evolutionism and creations at school? I suspect there's not going to be a lot of difference of opinion on this question. Is there any of the three of you who actually thinks there is a good argument for teaching both evolutionism and creationism? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. Because I, all I know about the, the evolution question comes from studying the debate. First, the debate between Bishop Wilberforce and Thomas Huxley at Oxford. And second, between um, Mencken, Darrow, and Bryan um, in Tennessee. And I think that, de- that debate should certainly be taught. I don't think that they should say, right, children, biology class is over, and now we're going to do divinity class. But should they teach the two or of them as, as having have, equal... It would be like saying we'll have astronomy and then we'll teach astrology. Hmm. Uh, no. 
not, 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 not to be taught in the science class, no, but the 